Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and our Redeemer. Amen. For today's observance of the Holy Cross, I want to start with a familiar American expression, sometimes amusing, but always with an edge of insult to it. That's good enough for government work. Go ahead, be amused if you like. I'm going to redeem it all in a moment. That's good enough for government work. I remember the first time I heard it said to me, it was during a summer teaching job back when I was a young graduate student. An older teacher was advising me about a program that we were planning together. I could tell by his tone of voice and attitude that I was not expected to perform my best work. He made it clear, rather, that I need not work so hard because I had already met the standard of work that was expected. I think you're trying too hard, was the way he put it. You're trying too hard. What you've done already is good enough, good enough for government work. How many of us today know the original context of that phrase? I would have failed a cultural literacy my t uh, test if I had been given that. Here's the surprising answer that more of us should know about. Today, the phrase means exactly the opposite of its original meaning. Nowadays, it means mediocre or even shoddy work. But it originally emerged following World War II as a reference to the best war production. A key example followed the attack on Pearl Harbor when government contractors rose to the occasion to achieve work of such exacting quality and performance standards that it could be used by the military to help win the war. Here in the United States, we feel something similar every year on 9-11, as we observed last week, a similar sense of national solidarity following a tragic attack but all the more powerful back in the 1940s and 50s was our sense of national pride and unity in rising to repel a disgraceful attack. That's why the phrase, good enough for government work, was originally expressed quite differently. Pronounced not with the accent on enough, good enough for government work, but with the accent on good, good enough for government work. The question naturally arises, therefore, how did something so positive in its original context evolve or devolve into something so disparaging or insulting today? Where today the comment can mean something mediocre or even shoddy, an interesting research project it would be to trace that development, don't you think? Also significant in that regard is the effort among some citizens and national leaders to reverse that sad decline in national pride and government excellence, to restore to its former meaning a phrase that was originally a, a, compl a compliment, meaning unparalleled work that surpassed the most rigorous and demanding standards. But, of course, pursuing those considerations is not what we're here for today. Rather, we have a more relevant question to address on this observance of Holy Cross. And yet, the preceding recollections are related in a curious way, because today we can open a similar line of inquiry about the cross. How can we reclaim and restore something to its original meaning after it has devolved into meaning something so mediocre and even ordinary? That's right. 
Today, the meaning of the cross has devolved into something mundane and worldly. Consider Jesus' expression from last Sunday's gospel reading, whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. From that verse, our popular expressions, that's my cross to carry, or it's my cross to bear. Those expressions have come to mean simply enduring some kind of trouble or performing some great ordeal. But that's a reduction of the meaning of the cross. It reduces it to something mundane and ordinary, trivial even. Rather, the deeper, truer meaning of the cross is something more challenging. Indeed, it's more a matter of failure and defeat rather than performance or success. Listen, for example, to this critique of the cult of successful service or performance. It, come, it comes from one of our 20th century English evangelicals, Oswald Chambers, and he wrote, the trap you may fall into in Christian work is to rejoice in successful service, rejoicing in the fact that God has used you. Our tendency today is to put the emphasis on service. Beware of the people who judge on the basis of someone's usefulness. If you make usefulness the test, then Jesus Christ was the greatest failure who ever lived. For the biblical saint, direction and guidance come from God's own self, not some measure of that saint's usefulness. Now, when Oswald declares that Jesus was the world's greatest failure, he means the measure of the standard of his time as regards being the Messiah. In that connection, Jesus did not meet expectations that he would serve his people as their promised Messiah by liberating them from Roman oppression. Rather, he failed that performance. Or as St. Paul affirms in today's reading, from Philippians, Jesus emptied himself of his power to perform to expectation. It was his powerlessness that was mysteriously or supernaturally effective. Another commentator, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, testified to that kind of failure as an icon himself of failure that is nonetheless failure that is nonetheless spiritually effective today. Bonhoeffer was the German Lutheran pastor and theologian who was involved in the failed plot to assassinate Adolf Hitler and was executed for that attempt by the Nazis just before the end of World War II. In his prison letters, he wrote this, God allows himself to be edged out of the world and onto the cross. God is weak and powerless in the world, and that is exactly the way, the only way, in which God can be with us and help us. It is not by his omnipotence that Christ helps us, but by his weakness and suffering. This is the decisive difference, Bonhoeffer went on to say, the difference between Christianity and all religions. Human religiosity makes us look in our distress to the power of God in the world. We use God as our deus ex machina, God is our machine. The Bible, however, directs us to the powerlessness and suffering of God. Only a suffering God can help. So, how do we reclaim today the true meaning of the cross? At the more mundane level, we're like those citizens who want to reclaim the meaning of the phrase, good enough for government work. But the reclamation of the true cross is so counterintuitive by comparison, as Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, because God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are. So if we want to be disciples of that gospel, then let us empty ourselves of self-will rather than 
performing our own will to power in one exploit after another. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, as Paul says in Philippians today. Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself. From now on, therefore, when we extol the Christian virtue of bearing our cross, what we are signing up for is emptying ourselves of the will to achieve some successful performance. May we also, therefore, like those who want to restore government work to its highest standards of excellence, agree to yield our lives to God's will as our standard so that what we do may be good enough, good enough for Holy Cross work. Thanks be to God.